A lot goes into making something scary. The build-up, the sound design, the music, the characters, and of course the visual techniques used to make us feel on edge or shock us. And that visual element is what we're going to be looking at today, a variety of cinematic techniques we see constantly in the horror genre. Now, most of these are things used often in film to immediately convey a sense of unease or danger that is associated with the horror genre, but you also see them in all forms of media like animation, music videos, and commercials, especially when they don't have have the luxury of an extended runtime to play around with convention. And the horror genre is one that in a lot of ways is more freeing than others. It can feel as if no rules need to be obeyed in terms of lighting, color, and sound compared to other genres. And most of these techniques go against the norms in order to make an audience feel that unease. Now some or all of these may seem obvious, but just because we know something doesn't mean we understand it. For me, I'm always diving into these core concepts and reevaluating to see what new understanding I can pull from them to be able to wield that tool on my next project, like Shadows. Shadows play into our primal fears, the fear of the unknown, the fear of what horrors could be lurking in the corner just beyond the light's reach. It's a fear that goes back to childhood and one of the strongest tools in the horror director's toolbox, which is why you have seen this utilized since the early days of film, even all the way back to the silent era like Nosferatu or the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. For me, it's the same idea as not showing the shark. What could be lurking in the shadows is almost always more frightening than what actually is. So toying around with that idea over a period of time is a great way to get your audience on edge. And there's plenty of ways to use shadows, of course. One sufficiently creepy technique is showing a villain or creature as a silhouette, often with the background lit rather than the subject. This gives you separation, but it can also make the danger feel like it doesn't belong, as if it's separate from our physical world where light can't touch it. This can work well to create an evil or demonic presence. And again, it's keeping the horror in obscurity, letting the audience project their imagination into a blank canvas, filling it with whatever terrifies them the most. Another way to use shadows is casting them on surfaces. Of course, the first images that pop into your head are from lighter fare, like Raiders of the Lost Ark, for example. But in horror, it can be used to employ a suspenseful buildup of a creature or villain approaching their victim, or to show a supernatural element, whether it's a shadow acting separately from its physical character, or even to show transformations. It's a nice tool used to create a gradual buildup before actually revealing a character on screen, and one that, for me, adds a whimsical nature into the creepy. Welcome to my home. And lastly, and most obviously, using the shadowed areas of the environment to conceal. Sometimes this is used to a point where some audience members might not notice anything or may just catch a small sense of movement. Other times it's used to initially completely hide something for it to then end up being revealed in the light, usually a character stepping forward into it. In a recent DJ podcast, Zach Kreger, the director of Barbarian, referenced a quote from David Lynch saying, there's nothing more beautiful than a body emerging and receding into pitch black. I love that quote, but I'd personally shift beautiful with unnerving. Some of the most goosebump inducing moments for me come from that very technique, like in Gerald's game. We are looking into the corner of the room, we think we see something, but we aren't entirely sure. But then at the perfect moment, director Mike Flanagan has the Moonlight Man move forward into the light, which for me was a far more effective scare than a typical jump scare would have been. Although shadows are used for that too. We have plenty more visual techniques to look at, of course, but first let's take a look at the opposite, which is music, with today's sponsor, Musicbed. Music is a huge factor in how something can be made scary. It sets the tone before you ever see any of those visual cues. And Musicbed is an amazing resource for licensed music for any project, including horror, or just to create your own playlist, like my playlist that I made for our short film, Sentry. I made it while writing that micro short and ended up using the music I found during the writing process in the final film as well. And I've been using Musicbed for around eight years now, including all the music that you've heard in this episode. They have all kinds of talented artists and musicians who are passionate about their work, and they curated a roster of over 1,000 authentic and relevant artists. And for me, the search function is just as important as the music itself, especially if you're like us and always against a deadline. And they have their browse and search tools built in with the filmmaker in mind. Use anything from genre, mood, to advanced filters like BPM, and they have a great list of curated playlists from filmmakers like myself. And if you still need help finding what you need, their team can help with complex complimentary song searches. So check out the link in our description for more info and use the coupon code FILMRIGHT at checkout to get one month free when you purchase an annual subscription.
Again, on average, you have a lot more freedom to get weird in horror than you do in other genres. And because of this license to explore and surprise, you can dive deep into more of the unique or odd across the board. And using less common camera angles is one that can immediately make the audience feel at unease. One of the most common of these would be the Dutch angle or oblique angle or Dutch tilt or canted angle. It has a lot of names. This is the shot that you've seen where the image is off its horizon, shifted to one side or the other. This can give a surreal or nightmarish feel as well as convey that something isn't quite right compared to the other leveled and structured shots that came before and after. It's as if the world around our character is being turned on its head. Then another uncommon angle is the God's Eye View or the Bird's Eye View. This is a top-down look at our scene, like this great run through the house in Malignant. They could have gone for a more traditional chase sequence through the house, but decided on this instead, which is both visually interesting and lends itself to what comes later on. For me, a shot like this doesn't heighten the tension or fear, but it removes you from it for a moment, allows you to breathe and enjoy the sequence. And given what's going on, it's a clever choice by director James Wan. <laughs> Then we have POV style shots, which you do see these in other genres, but it definitely gets the most use in horror. And the idea behind a shot like this is to, of course, put your audience in the shoes of someone or something. In horror, it's usually to either put the audience in the eyes of the killer or the monster, or letting the audience know that the character is being watched and in danger. Or it can do the opposite by placing us in the shoes of the actual victim. This can place us into the scene, allowing us to become the character as well as playing on the idea of voyeurism. With certain genres, there are often stereotypical visual styles that go with it. And with quite a few, you'll often see lighting that's intended to make the actors look as good as possible. But just as the camera is used, horror often flips these conventions and opts for more stylized and less flattering light. A common technique is lighting from below, just like that classic scary story by flashlight look. It plays on that childhood experience of highlighting facial features in an off-putting way, since its angle of light distorts the face in a way we aren't used to. Lights in or outside with the sun are almost always level to or above our faces. So this radical change gives an uneasy feeling. Or we can strip most of the light away and give our characters a flashlight. This narrows our vision, leaving the rest in darkness, again using shadows and the unknown to keep us on edge. And now we're waiting for something to jump out at us or for the light to stumble on something horrible. Found footage films utilize this a lot with the convention of a camera mounted light. It's also a quick and easy way to make a homey or comfortable environment feel creepy. Or you can make the light flicker with things like lightning or flashlights, or the cliche but always awesome faulty bulbs, all of which are typical to the horror genre, again drawing on that familiar convention of dark and stormy nights. Plus the sound of thunder is an easy go-to for horror-related media and experiences like a haunted house attraction. And again, this possibly links back to that primal fear and sense of the loss of control or that danger is coming, with the lightning and thunder signaling a coming storm, making our characters feel as though the exterior can be just as dangerous as the indoors, or just as a way to increase visual chaos during a tense scene. Like everything on our list, it can be translated in a litany of ways. It's up to you to have a firm grasp on your intentions to wield these tools for the intended end result. Just as much as how a red spot on a shirt could be either blood or a ketchup stain, it's up to you to supply the context that informs the audience's experience. <laughs> Horror has a lot of freedom in its use of color as well, and can go very surreal and obscure without distracting the audience in a way that other genres really can't. Dario Argento's Suspiria is probably one of the most vividly colorful horror films with a very saturated theatrical palette. And while we do see a variety of colors in the genre, most commonly used might be red, giving both a sense of danger and violence. There's a lot of theory out there on how certain colors affect us, and these can be utilized by the filmmaker in horror to convey things such as as fear, panic, and disgust. But just as I said before, it's up to you to supply the context to land these colors the way that you're intending. You could use the same color each time a character is killed to set an expectation in your audience that you can then subvert later, or use colors in a traditional way as a shorthand, or flip everything on its head to keep them off guard. For me, I'm a fan of shifts that you may not even notice on first viewing. Like with James Wan's The Conjuring, the film dances between a warmer and cooler look. In most moments, without a supernatural 
threat, you get a normal leaning skin tone and warmth. But when the supernatural danger shows up, that shifts to a cooler, more pale look. Like this moment where we're made to think there may be a ghost there, then two moments later when there actually is. Or the Warren's house versus the Perrin house. And then there's the idea of throwing all of that out and embracing the opposite. While shooting dark or night scenes is an effective way to kickstart that creepy vibe, don't be afraid to go against that convention. A lot of great horror films have great scenes in bright daylight settings. And for me, this is effective in a few ways. First, it's a great way to put your audience more on edge by showing them that they are not safe even in the sunlight, since we can have a sense of security once things are bathed in daylight, which makes it the perfect setting to twist that expectation and shock your audience. It can also be more disturbing since you are taking that setting that should be a comfort and adding darkness in. Similar to the idea of why things happening in spaces you are most vulnerable are so effective, like the shower. And yes, all of these ideas are somewhat obvious, if not completely, but I think the obvious things are often overlooked and misunderstood. We get so comfortable in the knowledge that two plus two equals four that we never do the equations or its variations for ourselves, so we end up knowing the thing without understanding it. So break down these ideas for yourself. Look at the films that use them. Dissect why they did it that way, why it was so effective on you. Then, and most importantly, try them for yourself. Fail at it, try again, and build your toolbox with understanding. But that's it for today. Subscribe if you're feeling generous and hit the bell to be notified when we put up more content. And until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat.